Oh, look at you with the facades. Let's let's see that mug before we get started. A little plug for the show. There it is. All right, where's our BET mug? Get the sweatshirt showing. Elliot, there we go. All right. Um, so this this is actually our first. Well, this is Elliot's third appearance and Manny's second appearance. So we're starting to see some uh, some some pattern here and uh, some fan favorites coming back on the on the show. But I kind of want to start um, by saying. Why, why is the guy that owns a testing lab on a farm up in New York and a facade consultant in Florida uh, becoming friends and taking interest in one another? Let's let's get into a little bit of the backstory behind that. Well, Elliot, do you want to take this one or should I? You take it. I think it's uh, there's a lot of similarities. We we come from similar. I think all three of us come from a similar background. We were all into this at some point as consultants, right? Elliot, you 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 were at some point with IBA. I think uh, you were there Adrian, when it was with Doris. And I think all three of us have this thing where we're everything we see, we're like, that doesn't sound right. I need to figure it out and and, and not taking whatever anybody's telling us as, as fact. And we're curious. We're always asking questions. And when I've met Elliot and when I've met you and I was asking questions, I'm like, wait a minute, he knows what, I, what he's talking about. I got to keep talking to him basically. And it's And it's been, what, a year and something now that actually, no, we met even before that, you and me, Elliot. Um, and we bounce ideas off each other. We kind of complain about everything off each other, and and it just goes on and on and on like that. Yeah, there's, there's been this loose association of the independent testing labs that um, I guess I could take credit for getting everybody together. But whether it's Bill Bill from High Tower Labs in Chicago, or Brian from uh, Field Verified, or the guys in Texas or California, we all kind of talk to each other because we don't consider each other it's the gentleman I like to say of the business, right? Um, and we don't consider each other, you know, competition and we try to help each other out because I think we all think that if everybody stays in their lanes and everybody respects each other, it's a good, you know, it, it's a good thing. It'll be good for all of us. No, none of us want to conquer the world. And that's what I think is driving us is just solid generational building up our businesses for the next generation. Well, I think it's interestingly too, I, 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 was with Manny recently in Florida, and I've spent countless amount of time in with Elliot here in the Northeast. But we're seeing a lot of the same trends and a lot of discussions or lack of discussions happening in certain areas of the market. You know, I in the first podcast with Manny, he was talking about uh, how much stucco has gone up over the years in, in Florida and the short term mindset of thinking about, well, how long is this stucco going to last? And are you going to have to do repairs three years, five years, seven years uh, post new construction? And then after that podcast, I was recently in Florida walking and I FaceTime or took a picture for Manny because I'm looking and I see on the back elevations all the patchwork being done uh, in repair work. So I think that sort of short term mindset uh, in the private development world in terms of what systems are being specified and built is not something that's geographically specific. Um, you're seeing it in a lot of these major markets. And And, and the sad part is probably time is not fixing it fast enough right so so when i started this whatever long ago i'm not going to tell you um it all seemed like well this is how it's done and and you know someday they'll, they'll learn right we knew what the problems were x amount of years ago and then today you get new builders new developers new architects but you also get the same old builders old developers and architects still doing the same thing saying well this is what we've done for 30 plus years and, and we're going to keep doing it and then you go they're never going to learn, you know, where like, I think you mentioned, oh, I see why you have a job. I'm like, I think we're always going to have a job. We're always going to have work. And to Elliot's point, there's more work than any one of us as a consulting or, or a testing laboratory can handle. And there's more benefit to collaborating than to compete, I think. I think it, beyond just complaining about how things aren't great, I think the other thing that, that, that uh, kind of links us is we want to improve it, right? We want it to be done better and not just because we want to make money, but because we also, we actually want it to be done better. And, and we see that there are ways to do it better. Yeah, I think, um, and, and part of this whole journey, not only starting with the content thing, but now uh, this podcast is primarily to get people on who are have way more experience than I do in areas that I don't have exposure to, to try to uncover a lot of this about the industry. And Elliot, I'm not going to mention who, but I told you the story I was at, uh, dinner the other night, and I want to turn this over to you and ask, you have some people in the industry who are so well, well respected with um, just incredible amounts of experience across different facade types in uh, across the world. And there seems to be this consistency of, A, we talk about the tribal knowledge aspect of it and not getting the right information out there, but also um, a reluctance to share the reality 
of what's actually happening in the industry in terms of um, lack of quality that we're seeing in commercial large scale buildings, not only how buildings were built in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, but even things that are still continuing to happen today. So I, what do you think that is in terms of a, a reluctance to share? Is it a legality thing, a liability thing? You know, how do we kind of change that mindset or shift people to want to open up and share more of those experiences? I think part of it is just everyone's been so busy and concentrating on new construction, new projects or major projects that they don't take on leak repairs. That's that's the reality of it is, is we get calls all the time. And I mean, all the time daily for leaks, doing leak investigations. And the first thing we tell somebody is, listen, I'm going to go out there and find where the leak is. What do you do after I do that? You need a facade consultant, an architect, an engineer who can take the information we give them of what we found and actually develop a repair for you. And the truth is, Everyone is so overwhelmed with work. I can't get anybody to pick those jobs up. I, there's no one for me to even recommend half the time because, listen, these aren't $150,000, $200,000 commissions for an engineer, for a facade consultant. Sometimes they are, but people don't want to hear that, that just the engineer is going to cost them X number of dollars. Forget about the repairs. And their first instinct is to tell me, if you find a leak, we'll get our corker to go out there and fix it. And I tell them, no, that's not the fix. That might cause you more problems than it's solving sometimes, many times. I'm not saying there aren't good waterproofers out there that can go out and do a good job fixing something if we identify it. But I don't know who they're hiring. We don't get that involved with these projects, right? And a big part of it is, is that everyone has gotten so busy and the guys with the gray hair who can look at a leak job and come up with not just a temporary fix, but a root cause of the problem and then fix the root cause for them. Even if it's painful for them to hear it, where you have to say, listen, we have to throw a blue tarp over the building for the next two years. Uh, 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 I'm using that as a, as a simile, the blue tarp, but even if we have to throw a blue tarp over it for the next two years, I have to get in there and figure out what the root cause is and how we fix it without pulling the facade off your building. Because I got to tell you guys, we're coming across more and more buildings where that's the recommendation. If they ask me, I would tell them your facade is a real problem and it's all the way down to the core. You mentioned EFs. It's not just Florida that has problems with EFs. We're getting a lot more EFs because continuous insulation allows them to meet the energy code and exterior insulation is really attractive to people, right? Because it doesn't really take away from finished space. It works really well when it's done right, but people just don't know how to do it correctly, even legally, because to do EFs right, there's certain things you have to do at every opening, like back wrapping the boards. Right. This is something people don't consider. But if you don't back wrap the board, you don't have that F NFPA fire detail anymore. And really, that's not a legal job anymore. How many actual inspectors look at that and know when recognize it? My guys are sending me pictures all the time and we give whoever we're hired by or whoever we know on the job a heads up and say, hey, the edges of your boards are not back wrapped. The openings are not back wrapped. You have to look at this and really think about it. And uh, of course, if you're caulking to styrofoam, that's not a good watertight joint. In addition to the fire rating, it doesn't work for waterproofing either. So, I mean, this is just, you talk about tribal knowledge. This shouldn't be tribal knowledge. Stowe, uh, all those companies, BASF, or I think the Master Seal now, these guys all need to do a better job of getting the information that they have. All the EMA, that's the Exterior Insulation Manufacturers Association, they have great programs. But you know what? People don't want to spend $750 in a week to send somebody to learn how to do it right, which is a shame. But we have to do a better job of educating trades and, and inspectors and specifiers these days. So is there is there do you see enhanced quality with um, a panelized EFIS product uh, product versus your patchwork EFIS? It's not necessarily a lower quality associated with EFIS, you know, generalization. It's not fair to say it's more so. Uh, the means of system type and then application in the field. Manny, you want to? Well, uh, I wanted to kind of expand a little bit on what you were saying before, and then I'll come back to, uh, you know, Adrian's question if I understand it. So are you are you referring to panelization as, as unitized panelization versus individual EFIS foam panels, Adrian? Is that what, yeah. you, what you're referring to? So I've seen I've seen manufacturers do it now, not, not necessarily just with EFIS, but, but the entire wall assembly, right? So imagine a curtain wall of of framed wall construction. And I, I, I try to avoid, because from my side, I'm independent and, and you know we're not tied to any manufacturer. So I try to avoid in these uh, discussions to bring up any manufacturer, but I know a few that are now doing stud framing, sheathing, uh, weather-assisted barrier, 
and the exterior finish, sometimes EFIS, all in one, I guess the EFIS would have to come in last because then I have to tape the seams of these panels. And I see so many benefits to it. In fact, I've told them, because obviously I'm thinking about my market, get it through testing, get these panels uh, impact, cyclic and, and water tested so that you can basically destroy this market. Because then the, there's, I think you and I talked about before, where's the labor that's installing all this? And, and, and to Elliot's point, it's, it's a cock guy that maybe just started doing sealant work, right? And then there's some guy doing foam work and then maybe they got the stucco guy trying to do EFIS finishes, which is not what you want to do. And, and like you said, they're not back wrapping. They don't understand what that even means when we say it to them in the field. They just figure nobody's going to see this if I'm not there 100% of the time inspecting it. Good luck, you're finding it after the fact. Um, but, but I think there's, ironically, there's uh, one thing that, that I think we've touched upon is location doesn't matter, right? You guys are up there, I'm down here. And we're saying exactly the same thing. We're having, we're seeing exactly the same kind of root cause. And I remember, what is it, 2008, 2009, 2010, the economy does that whole shift with whatever, the recession. And we went from new construction work to forensics, right? And retrofit. And that was the whole market. And, and, and I remember switching companies at that point. And all we got was leak investigation. I need to go fix it. What do we do? We don't have money to build a new building. I got to fix this one kind of deal. And at that point, people were understanding, oh, maybe we should do it better next time. Then the economy does this whole 180, shoots up into all new construction territory. You can't tell somebody, build this in the right way because in 10 years, you're going to be dealing with it. He's like, 10 years, between now and 10 years, I'll have done 10 of these cheaply and somebody else is going to deal with them for the next 10 years kind of deal. And that's, that's really where, where the other part of it is. We're not finding, in the new construction realm, we're not finding clients that are, that are typically holding the, those properties. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's no incentive for them to say, I'm going to make this last 20, 30, 40 years. The incentive is if I can flip it in three or four, I'm done with that. Um, I, what I'm assuming is if there is a shift, a major shift in the economy, and we're back to there's nothing else to do. We'll see, we'll see more improvements in construction. But again, it will just be retrofit. It won't be a complete 180 of what we're doing now kind of deal. Um, I think that answers your question at the beginning and, and kind of touching on what uh, Eddie was saying. The other part of the, of the consulting is what I'm seeing from colleagues across the board is there's no, I got to put it this way, there's no money in engineering, right? So, so whenever I was interviewing engineers, when I was doing a lot of curtain wall engineering, it was always like, look, you're going to learn a lot. It's a lot of fun. It's super exciting, super cool. The money's not there. If you want to make money, go build, right? Um, then the other side of it is, if you want to make money as an engineer, go litigate, right? So, so that's where the money is. The money is in claims assistance, litigation assistance, you know, hurricane claims assistance, that kind of thing. And obviously Florida is notorious for it. So uh, I think we, we were going to discuss briefly uh, air barriers I don't say air barriers to people down here. I say water barriers, right? And, and, and by, by the way, it also serves as my air barrier because that's where they're afraid. They're afraid that they're going to get sued because there's bulk water coming into their building. None of them are getting sued because there's a draft. They're not getting sued because the AC or the, or the energy bill is high. They're getting sued because there's bulk water coming into that building. And we're basically trying to serve two or three or four different control layers with, with a weather assisted barrier on, on the outside. So there's Elliot's cue to, to tie into exactly what you just said that the air barriers acting as the water barrier. Uh, so Elliot, what, what kind of, I guess, are you now more frequently getting hired to do air barrier testing? Is that becoming more of a focal point? And where do you think, I guess, the biggest um, misunderstanding is in the market? So let me start with the misunderstanding. So for years we called it membrane or AVB, and there's been so many terms, and then you can get into classifications, class one, class two, class 20. It's, it's, important people understand that there's a marketing side of the term air barrier and there's an actual functional side of the term air barrier in our stuff at our company we use air barrier with a capital a and a capital b meaning the material itself and then air barrier with a small a and small b meaning the line around the building that stops air and water from passing from the exterior to the interior now that can mean windows caulking roof membranes flashings obviously membranes those things are all part of the air barrier of the building, but it's it's important to think of that as a line of separation. And not only is it the line of separation for the air at this point, but it's also in most buildings we work on also that water barrier line, right? Because 90% of the projects we work on are rain screen or pressure equalized walls. So where we stop the air is where we stop the water. And uh, that's real important. And I think, I think in trying to do the right thing, people have you have really gone out and pushed the term air barrier and forgotten that it's also the water barrier of the building. And yes, I agree 100% with what Manny's saying. We're not getting up here. We don't get many calls for 
humidity caused or condensation caused issues. I'm not saying we don't. Um, I just had a call from one last week that I phone diagnosed as a condensation issue because of where it was and what they were describing. I may be proven wrong, but it's the first time in a while I told somebody, you know what, I think you might have a condensation issue. 90% of the time, it's a bulk noise, it's a bulk water issue because people don't realize that thing has to act as your water stop on the building. And in Florida and other climate zones that aren't where we are in the Northeast, having the correct type of air and vapor barrier is important. We want a perme permeable barrier, but that also can be dangerous because people think I put it up and they forget that it needs to be continuous so that you have to be able to trace that line from the mem from the below grade to the above grade to the window openings and make sure it's continuous because if it's not continuous it doesn't matter if you used an ultra smart ai membrane that can think about water before it stops it if it's not continuous and you have voids in a modern basically tight because the problem is these buildings are tighter than they were in the old days now we have a lot more built up negative pressure in these buildings that will suck water in without a storm coming, you get water in through the buildings. And we find it's not the huge leaks that are the problem. It's the small ones that get in behind the wall and live in that insulated cavity between studs and soak up by the fiberglass and soak, get soaked up by the sheetrock. You don't know there's a problem until a piece of sheetrock falls off and you see the, the back of it is black. And that's well, so the first side of the problem. When Elliot comes in, it's too late. He's he's looking at it from the investigation side. But if you think about it as control layers between your air, water, vapor, and thermal, Manny, when you're kind of on the early consulting side in a schematic drawing set, are you looking at all those interface details and trying to sketch out all your control layers to find those inconsistencies? Uh, I don't remember if it's in the EDA documents or in you know the, the Michael T. Kubal books where they talk about the pen test. So I do it mentally. I always tell my team, just grab a pen, draw a line around. As soon as you hit a break, that's the detail you got to start asking for. Um, and I do it in plan view. I do it in vertical. But, but what's funny is, how do I put this off? I'm not that old, but I feel like I sound like an old man when I say, you know, you tell them to do the right thing. And then you go out there and they've got a big old hole in the wall. So like Elliot's saying, if the air barrier is not there, it doesn't matter if it's a smart air barrier. The hole in the wall, there's no air barrier there. And I get that a lot. I get post-installed penetrations for like, you know, fire suppression systems and things like that, or just electrical. The electrical guy came in after the, 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 the wall cladding guy. Um, there, there was a lot to unpack on what, on what Elliot was saying. And, and the fact that it's not just, you know, true lack of knowledge or not wanting to find out. Marketing and, and, and material manufacturers have, have something to do with this, right? So if you think about uh, insulation, right? Foil-faced insulation. Why are we installing foil-faced insulation interior on, in Florida projects, right? Uh, it's just, it's something that you walk into a residence right now, you walk into a mid, mid rise and you'll see that there's a uh, foil face insulation, which is serving as, as an interior vapor barrier. You're not supposed to do that, but the material manufacturer says they're building like crazy in Florida, got all this, you know, insulation. And my, my, uh, uh, what is it? My product data sheet says that it's a radiant, you know, reflective foil. Who cares? We're, we've got the heat on the outside, right? We're not reflecting from the inside. So there's no reason why you should be using uh, foil face insulation in South Florida. Yet that is the norm, unless there's a consultant there telling you don't do that. That's going to be a problem, right? Um, you, you mentioned, you know, rent screen uh, systems a lot for you guys. Yes, we're dealing a lot with barrier systems. And, and at that point, there's no real, uh, call it water and even air control layer other than the outside face of that barrier. And now we're talking about, well, how do I transition into that glazing system? How do I transition to the louver and into the penetrations? Um, and, and what we find ourselves doing, unfortunately, is a little bit of screaming at the wall when you come in and you tell a client this could happen and they don't believe you because that's really what it is you're, you're doing preventative honestly it's it's a, it's a shitty example but uh, sorry um it's you mentioned that you've done kind of the telehealth on the phone um and and you know i thought about when the i'm doing that ahead of time i'm saying look you should go get checked for this because you're going to have an issue and you're like I'm young and, and that doesn't matter. And that's what we're getting out of, out of developers and architects. It's, well, I've never had a problem with this. So it's gonna cost me money, money Manny. Sorry, we're not gonna do it. And, and we just gotta say, well, owner decided not to do X, Y, and Z. We'll be back here in 10 years when when, when this kind of goes back. Basically. We're, this is the perfect uh, sort of intersection between Manny coming in early with his team and doing this 
this pen test, drawing your lines and saying, here's going to be an inconsistency or penetration. This is your corner transition detail where you're going to have a problem. And then way down the line, Elliot's coming in and finding that failure and having to diagnose it. And there seems to be this disconnect between those two spectrums. So wouldn't you think time and time again, the same issues are coming up? Why, why is that not getting through to some people? I think because the owners don't, this is going to sound like a knock at, at facade consultants and, and architects. It's not meant to be, but owners that call us, call their architects and facade consultants back to repair the problem. The same people who either they didn't listen to, who told them what to do right the first time, or unfortunately, there's some out there that don't raise the issues the first time. You know, we have, uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of facade consultants that really think they're window consultants, right? And the facade stops at the cork joint between the window and the wall. And that's not the case. You're supposed to be looking at the whole thing. You know, again, back to the air barrier, water barrier thing. Where does your work stop? It's it's the facade. It's the envelope. Maybe you exclude roofs and below grade because those are specialties that are handled by specific guys. Sometimes a lot of people, I think, man, you, you do both, right? You do roof, yep. facade, yep. everything. A lot of people here, everything below grade becomes the engineer's responsibility. And I understand why in our market, because we have a lot of we have a lot of stuff going on that has to be addressed, not just from a water penetration side, but structural pressures and hydraulic pressures that happen down there. So I can understand that one. But I think people just don't realize that, you know, you're supposed to uh, you're supposed to you're supposed to have deliverables from your professionals. And some of those deliverables include a water and an airtight bill, uh, uh, an air controlled building. No, no buildings airtight and a building that doesn't take water and bulk water. And that's. That's a minimum that people should be expecting. And you can't expect the contractors to take care of it. It's got to be done way in advance. The pen test, and for people that don't know, you're supposed to trace that line around the building. And if you pick the pen off because that air, if you pick the pen off the plan, that means there's an interruption in the air barrier or in the thermal layer of the, of the building. And that's the problem is that, you know, that's a simple, simple thing that I think most people are taught their first two years in, in, as a facade consultant. But I don't know that that's being done anymore. I think we just see uh, in New York, we call them the EN pages, right? They're the energy code pages that are at either the beginning or the end of the set of architectural drawings. And I just see the same detail recirculated over and over and over again. It's a dotted line around the around the, a section view of the building. And that that's meaningless. That's meaningless, right? That means nothing. No, people have to look at the details. There, sh there should be a minimum of 30 details on the end page. It's not just a dotted line about around the building. You should be required to show how it ties to the roof. You should be required to show how it ties to fenestration. You should be required to show how it ties to penetrations. Even if you can't hit every one, you should have at least two or three typical penetration details. And then how it ties to the blow grade stuff as well. And I'm probably missing something there, but this is the problem. The building code has to catch up. We have it in the code now. There's a requirement. Don't forget, I remind people, 25 years ago, we didn't even have an energy code. You didn't have to have an air barrier. And the three of us, maybe not you, Adrian, as much, but Manny and I have built tons of buildings that had no air barrier. The backup block wall was the air barrier, and we caulked the windows to it. And if you were lucky, they agreed to do an inside line of caulk, not just an outside line of caulk. But there's air barriers and water vapor barriers we learned how to control water from getting in the building, but we weren't controlling it from getting into cavities where bulk water should not have been in the old days. We just knew how to get it out, but we didn't know how to keep it out. And, and that's what's changing today. We're building much less backup walls out of solid masonry materials like CMU and much more out of light gauge or light building materials like steel stud with a gypsum exterior sheathing that's very sensitive to water. And if you don't keep water off of it, bulk water off of it in a cavity wall condition or a, a rain screen wall condition, you're going to have major problems, not just leaks. You're going to have structural stud deteriorating and maybe not being structural anymore because it's rusted out. So this is these are issues. We're starting to see that now. We're starting to look at walls that have leaks and saying, hey, you've got more than just a water problem here. You've now got you got to have a, a structural engineer come in and look at this because it's compromised now. It's well, so compromised. we've been We've been really focusing on the design side of things, but where do you think more emphasis moving forward, if you had to pick one, has to be placed on the schematic design side of things and detailing or the actual construction and execution? I'll take it. It's There's no, I tell clients this, if you don't do a proper design, it's a disaster. If you, if you don't um, 
uh, you know, put it out to bid correctly, meaning that you don't qualify the bidders and, and they don't really go through the design package, it's a disaster. You don't build it correctly and inspect it correctly, it's a disaster, right? So there's not one of those that I can say, you can do these three and forget about the last one, you should be fine. Um, they all go hand in hand. And I think I've, I've tailored our website this way saying, look, we do design, we do consulting, we do inspections, then we do testing, then we do forensics. When everything else was missed, we'll come back and, and try to fix the issue. Um, but but there's, there's a few things that we're not gonna be able to solve. And, and, uh, and having other conversations with, with a local climate tech hub, I keep coming back to money and incentives, right? Where, you know, we talked about last time how your code is, is bullying people into doing the right thing regarding energy, right? It's all about money. <clears throat> when you look at a, some of these decisions, a, you're, a lot of the people that we're talking to sometimes don't even know what a consultant is, at least down here, right? So granted, Same. you're doing a lot more frame construction, but down here, it's mostly masonry. And I see, I mean, South Florida, or, you know, Broward and West Palm Beach now. And it's because of our hurricane loads. And, and in that case, it's much more forgiving. You, you have a mass wall there and it's probably, you know, it's got reinforcing and, and, and grouted uh, cells. Uh, so you, you're, you're getting that benefit and you're using, if you've got on your, us on your project, you're using breathable assembly. So even if you get some moisture drive in there, some vapor drive in there, the AC is gonna pick it up and, and that kind of thing. I mean, remember, you're gonna oversize your AC. That's the other part of it. So to Elliot's point, we're, we're, we're creating these, these, these massive uh, mechanical equipment systems and then trying to say, uh, trying to assume that a small hole in the wall is not gonna have a big impact. It's gonna have a huge impact because it's being sucked in by this, by this crazy uh, design of, of a mechanical system. So beyond them not knowing what a consultant is and what a consultant is, and I'm talking about design professionals. I'll go to a networking meeting and I'll say, hey, this is us and here's what we do. And, and the first thought is that we go out there installing facades, right? And we go out there installing it. And I go, no, we consult them. What does that mean? Why would I hire you, right? And then what you do get a lot of is they want to use the contractors as consultants, right? So yes, we get uh, lunch and learns and presentations almost weekly at this point, but we understand that there is a place for the manufacturer's rep, there's a place for the contractor. I rely heavily on contractors and their experience on what to do, but but you can't expect that a window contractor will know what to do with the deck coating or the waterproofing, or or that a, a roofing contractor will know how to transition over to the EFIS system. That's never gonna happen. There's no one contractor that does all those. And that's what clients expect. They say, well, my roofer said I should do this. I'm like, well, your roofer doesn't know that your wall is this, and that's not gonna play well, right? But again, for you to come in, like Elliot was saying in the beginning, to say, well, you're gonna have to pay me to tell you this while I'm not gonna touch your building. I'm not gonna install the roofing system. I'm not gonna install the interior cladding system. Yet, um, I had a client tell me recently, she said, look, we like it when you're on projects because you pick up on stuff before they happen. But the only reason they know that is because they've worked with other people and, and they've had situations where nobody picked up on what was gonna happen and, and it happened, right? But, but we can't prove the negative of, hey, listen, if you don't have us on this job, an issue is going to happen and it could cost you a lot of money. It's, it's essentially a gamble, right? Um, yeah, I'm glad you brought that. I actually used to think about that a lot when I was on the facade consulting side, how to justify the value add or how to justify mitigating that downside risk, what you're offering by having your whatever, whatever size contract bringing you on, how much they could potentially save at the end. I don't know how to put metrics associated well, with that. Well, first think about, Manny, what would you say your average cost for a project is in terms of percentage of the overall project cost. It's a fraction of a percent. Fraction of a percent, yeah, it's a fraction it, of a percent. And then when you take in the cost of actual, just picking on waterproofing, right? Usually when we would look at a deck that's, oh, it's $400,000, $200,000 to waterproof a deck, properly waterproof this deck, slope it, drain it, and, and have, you know, in our case, an NOA compliant system. When the issue happens, you're talking about that same deck after the overburden's in and lawyers are involved and people are, are suing each other, you're talking about four, five, ten million $10 million for a four hundred thousand dollar deck, basically, right? So it's it's incomparable, and this is that your you know, fee. How much for that? Your oh, for fee would have been what? I don't know, three thousand, four thousand dollars just for that deck, right? So we're a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of what could be an exponential cost to do it right after the fact, right? And and the loss of value, the loss of time, that's not even adding any of that up. Um, it's and that's that's to your point, Adrian. It's hard to to prove to somebody. It's like selling insurance, baby. Right? You want to buy this because sure. you know you're you're not going to have an issue in the future. And, and especially with the older ones, when they say, well, I've never had an issue in the past. And really my experience is, well, you weren't called to that issue. Owner found somebody else to solve it. They didn't want to go after you. They couldn't find some guy to sue you kind of deal. Uh, but, but most of the time when I'm seeing projects, I'm, I'm doing kind of what you do. Well, I'll pick up the phone before I issue the bid. And I say, if they call me for a water test, for example, I say, do you really need a water test? Because you're, what do you want? And they say, well, I want to find out why it's leaking. I'm like, well, you don't need a water test. You need an investigation. When they say I have a quality control test because my specs call for it, then yes, that's a simple water test. Um, but but they're they're not coming in 
very seldomly are they are they really coming in willingly. Some of them that are smart are saying, I, I want to prevent issues, and and but I also have a budget that I need to respect, so you don't have free reign on the design. And and others are saying, I've never used this before. I don't see the point, and it's costing me a lot of money, so I'll go as cheap as possible. And you know, man, when, you remember what I said before. They're not they're not used to building that way. They're, they never did it before. But construction has changed so much now, L like in New York, in 15 years, we've gone from the majority of buildings we built to either being window wall all the way up the building or a brick on block wall with punched windows to today. Everything is exotic cladding over a rain over a light gauge framed rain screen wall with with windows in it with some. And, and even when it is brick, we've got these very exotic details to hang the lintels on these steel stud walls, some of the lintels are hanging down two and three feet. They have thermal separation built into the hanging system because of the energy code. It becomes a real, real challenge to get that stuff right. It's one of the reasons why we, we're, we're really pushing for less expensive, smaller mock-ups for these jobs because people don't know how to put all those parts and pieces together. And the guys who say, we never did this, we never needed to do this type of work before. It's because you were used to having an insert in the edge of the slab and putting the, the lintel into that insert, screwing it in direct, we're putting it on light gauge framing now and, and trying to waterproof it, make it work structurally, insulate it, isolate it, and then put the brick on it and the window under it. It's very, very complicated today. I think a lot of developers still think they're building the, the way they did in the 90s, and they don't realize the buildings aren't designed and built that way now. If I can ask you a question about that. So with your, your code changes, you have the continuous insulation requirement, you have the, the thermal bridge issue, but you also have to mechanically connect that exterior cladding. So you're doing through insulation connections, I'm assuming, or are you doing? Are you able to break the insulation with these, with these hangers and, and Z-clips? So thermal bridging hasn't, thermal, with the building code now only requires people to report thermal bridging but not to actually count it against their energy code points. So, but that was by design. I was on the energy code revision committee when we talked about this because no one really had a good way of, of accounting for that seven, eight years ago when we started the code committee. And since then, of course, there is more software and, and straight calculations you can do to account for that, but it's coming where, you know, things are getting more and more difficult. And yeah, people attack it all different ways, right? Some people, I think people are mostly going to be comfortable with taking the hit on those lintels and saying, okay, I have a negative one for that, but I have a positive four for an extra inch of, of mineral wool on the outside of my air barrier. And, you know, it's that trade-off that they're going to get used to because, yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a little bit scary today, the compromises we're making to make sure that we meet the energy code and and maybe not looking at everything well enough structurally. I just uh, I just had a conversation with one of the insulation manufacturers. We have a mock-up in house that's a wall that I just described: steel stud backup wall, hung lintel, complicated. And we want to when this mock-up is done, we want to start doing some thermal analysis on what the real effects of thermal bridging are on these walls. You know, we know it's there, but if you have exterior continuous insulation how much is it impacting you in reality, in BTUs? Because guys, BTU is a term that we throw around like nothing. How many people actually understand what a BTU is? Well, so if right. we're talking about all these new means of affixing different types of cladding to uh, the, the structure and how, how we're managing our control layers, who is ultimately responsible for detailing and making sure these walls work? I mean, architects are coming up with a new concept or dream of what they want to build and the contractor is trying it, testing it, validating it if it works, and the facade consultant is going to take the overly conservative approach to make sure nothing goes wrong on site. But at the end of the day, I mean, who's really taking ownership? If we're on a project, we're, we're expecting that we're looking at all those transitions, right? So so there's not a project that we're consultants on that we're going to say, there's cladding and, and kind of good luck, right? If, if the exterior walls are in my scope and there's mechanical penetrations into your WRB, we're going to figure out a way to seal those and detail those. And that's kind of where I was going. So I went into a presentation that wasn't for New York work, but and they were talking about trying to design this this structural connection that that goes beyond the foam, beyond the insulation. And I kind of came up with a few details for them, like on site. And and they're oh, that's a great idea. I guess you've solved it. But I, I haven't had further conversations with anybody. Um, it, it's also the um, you know if if you're looking at who one thing the consultant is not going to do is draw it out for the architect, right? The architect has to understand what the different components are. And and sometimes when it's something new. 
Um, but we you have will the mark up their drawings, right, Manny? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we'll redline everything. But but the thing is, when there are no drawings to redline, right? So uh, down here, we have the benefit of the product approvals that are designed and tested and drawn systems. So the architect can pick those details from the manufacturer, plug them into their drawings, and then we'll go in there and we'll sketch out and say, here's where you're going to transition to the windows, to the walls, et cetera. Until, um, they're, until they're not. I mean, I won't name which development, but you told me about a, a job that was sold and where they had to kind of in situ design a window wall with a substructure to make it look like a curtain wall. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's the other part that we do. So, I've done it where I'm hired by the glazing contractor, right? So, the, it's almost like a design assist uh, situation where, where where owners are a little bit weary about that because then they say, well, if you do the design assist, you spend X amount of months or years doing that design assist, then am I tied to you because you've already done this work? So, what we've told developers and architects is, look, we have the capability to do this design assist for you without any manufacturer. Right? Basically, we can get it to, to the point of proof of concept and saying, now anybody with these I values and these kind of you know, connection details and transition details can go ahead and, and, and manufacture and actually test this system and get it out in the field. Um, but that's going straight into the window portion. When you go back into the exterior walls, um, even that you can kind of treat it the same way. So we've talked to architects about, this is what I want the building to look like. And we go, okay, here are four or five different attachment methods. Where's your property line? How much can I go out on that property line? What's your energy uh, requirements? Which is the conversation that I wanted to ask uh, Elliot. Have you gotten feedback from, from the energy consultants about like what's really driving the needle, right? Is it, is it in our case, obviously solar heat gain coefficient, but going back to air barriers and air infiltration, I'm assuming that has a huge effect on the energy calculations and the performing of, performance of these buildings. So, unfortunately, air leakage is something that's totally, not totally, but I would say 30% of it is design related and 70% is application related, right? So you can make a mistake on how you detail your building for sure, but the majority of the air leaks are faulty workmanship, bad, bad practices in the field. So how do you account for that during design? You can't really. So okay. air, air leakage is almost ignored during design other than the pen test, like we talked about before. And let me tell you, somebody makes starts making substitutions, doesn't really understand what they're substituting with. Most architects don't understand the complexity or the intricacies of different products that they're being asked to substitute. And I tell people all the time at these AIA lectures and everything else, don't accept substitutions once you know your design is approved unless you really understand what they're selling you and you check with the manufacturer, the installer, that the thing that's being asked to substitute will function equally, not just have numbers that are equal on a piece of paper, but will function the same way as what you have approved because it's dangerous. So air leakage, unfortunately, other than the blower door test, we, and Adrian, you asked this earlier, whether or not we're getting more and more of this testing. We are with public agencies like the New York City schools, the Department of Design and Construction, we're starting to get more and more air barrier testing and air barrier continuity testing with those agencies, but then they stop. Every school we've ever done in New York City is required to have a blower door test in the end. You know how many we've actually blower door tested? None. So, so this goes back to, I wanna go back to who who's supposed to take ownership. And I don't know how much of this man you see down there, but in certain regions here, we see a lot of architects subcontracting the facade consulting. So they bring on a facade consultant to help them detail the yep. building. And in that case, do the incentives or, or does the scope look different than if you're hired from the owner? Uh, not necessarily. What we're seeing is that we're seeing the same down here. Basically, the owner does not want to take the design liability away from the architect. So the architect may pick up the consultant for the DD, uh, CD phase and maybe even during construction administration just for shop drawing and some little reviews. And then the owner might pick up the consultant for inspections. Um, I kind it depends who I'm dealing with. There are architects where I would say I would prefer to be hired by the architect because I know performance is key and I don't want to be hired by the owner because I know cost is key, right? So so in that scenario, I want to be on the on the side of performance. Uh, if it's the other way around where, where it's maybe a, a, an architect with less experience, less capabilities, and I know the owner has, and I have those, uh, I have clients up from New York that are big on performance. I, I almost would rather be hired by the by the owner because I can say, listen, I am, uh, you know, uh, responsible for their requirements, not you, right? So, so that's where there's a little bit of a challenge, depending who brings me in, where, where if their if their needs don't align or their wants don't align, then I'm kind of caught in the middle of, well, he's my client, you you made him hire me, kind of deal. But yes, absolutely, there is a it's subconsulted, 
but you remain a, uh, uh, you know, not the prime designer, right? You don't automatically become the designer of record. The, the, the liability still falls within the architect as, as the final, you know, prime consultant. Um, it's, but then they are, you know, responsible to the owner who is again, holding the budget saying, sorry, Mr. Architect, I know you have this dream for this beautiful building, high performing, I don't have a budget for it. This is going to break my, my, my revenue uh, and sales numbers on this project. Well, so, who, you know, uh, I guess as a consultant, you can be very meticulous about your verbiage and, um, we have a new, we have a third Elliot joining. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry about that. Man. I think he got yeah. technical something. difficulties. Our third guest just joined the podcast if you're watching <laughs> visually. So, so as as a facade consultant, you could be very meticulous about your verbiage and say, this is where our scope starts and stops. This is what we witnessed. This is what we were not on site for. We didn't get to witness the insulation within the back pan. We weren't in the unitized shop or we didn't get to see that gasket or joinery seal installed. And then the liability is not on them. But as the architect of record, are you ultimately responsible for what you specified and then ensuring that that's what was built? In theory, yes. So what you'll see is, and you use the word specify, a lot of projects, in fact, most projects down here do not include specifications, right? And, and that's part of it. It's, it's part of, if I have these very detailed specifications, I also have to make sure that they are enforced, which is what we do when we're doing submittal review. Is it, is it per specs? And it's easy, it's going back to the specs of, well, this is what we all agreed to, whether it's wrong or right, this is what we said we were gonna do. If you don't have those, it's easy to say, you know, send me additional information, Mr. Contract. And the executive contractor sends the information, it's easy to approve something where you don't have a rigid process, like Elliot was saying, that says, this is the requirement for me to approve this substitution. If it's simply send me a product data sheet that says A and B are similar, then, then you're good. And then I think in the liability perspective, I think that's potentially what I've heard that one of the reasons why they don't do specs is because they get able to say, well, you know, I did it to the best of my abilities based on the information I had. That's as much. I'm not an expert at XYZ. I relied on consultant X to tell me that this was okay, right? So, so there is that kind of push off when there aren't specs. When there are specs, it's, it's an easier world because uh, it's very easy to tell the owner uh, when they're doing a VE exercise, for example, you're not getting apples to apples. And all we do is education. We can't make the decision for them. We tell them, if we specified X, X roofing system for all these reasons, they propose this, it has these similarities. These are where the differences are. This is why we recommended this product. You make the decision. You know, that's it. You're, you're taking the risk, not us. And Manny, that's part of the service you guys offer as the facade consultant is to review both those specifications at the beginning of the project and substitutions when they tell you that they're making a substitution during the project, right? And to me, with the way materials are changing right now and technology is changing on these projects, that's so critical because how many architects can actually keep up with sealant changes? air barrier material changes, changes in window technology, thermal breaks. We have thermal breaks that changed in 10 years from a ported to bridge polyurethane to everyone's on polyamide nylon reinforced thermal bridges, breaks, sorry, breaks now that are 25 and 35 millimeters deep now. We have windows that are aluminum, but they're really more plastic than aluminum today. And you know what? That has an impact on what you make a decision about when you accept something to satisfy one portion of one code and don't look at it as a facade expert will. How is it affecting my other code? Let's look at the dead load. We have heavy glass in this thing. It's a cantilevered piece of, of aluminum outside that's connected by, by plastic. Yes, it's a structural plastic, it's engineered, but we probably know there are limitations to it that have to be considered and not everybody's looking at that every time. That's just one example. Compatibility of materials is huge today. Huge. To add to add further complexity, what then happens if you have a separate design architect and then architect of record, and you do or don't have a facade consultant involved? So you have this outlandish new design, custom this, custom that, and then it sort of falls on the architect of record to drive it through CD phase and ensure everything is actually built per code and is going to perform. I'll, I'll I'll throw it back at you. So if you're on a project, Usually, when you get awarded a project as 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 you know the window contractor, are you early or are you late by the time you get that contract? Early. You're early. Great. I want but your. They're not the rule because they really are involved with architects. No, but I'm saying by the time are. it gets awarded to you, because what I see and and I've been on the side of working for contractors 
And usually it's by the time the contractor gets the project, the glazing contractor, and they say to me, we've just got this project, we're late because they took a year to decide to negotiate with four or five different bidders and they lost a year in the design phase. And I think that's been my experience all the way up to the designer of record versus the architect of record, where the designer of record may have spent a year, two years, and is back and forth of selecting materials, doing a few different cost analyses. By the time the architect of record gets it, they're shooting for permit submittal, right? So the, the architect of record usually is under the gun to produce, produce, produce. And my experience has been that usually what they'll try to do is take whatever the design of record said, put it into their drawings, make sure that all the lines align. And there is not a, 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 a sufficient enough level of detail creation in those, right? And, and well, that's yes, where it gets so confusing though too, because there are times, and it depends, I guess, how much sway the architect has and how strong or, or they're gonna hold to their true design or specs. But there have been projects I've been on where a portion of the facade was allocated to a certain contractor. And I was told, well, the owner has a special deal with them and you know whatever they can perform or whatever they can offer is what we're gonna use. And so that's where things really get messy. And, and that was the discussion we had before, whereas who is our client, right? And, and, and everybody's client is the owner. So it doesn't matter what the architect's trying to do. In the end, the owner can say, this is not part of my owner performance requirements. Please, thank you very much and, and move on. Um, and, and that's been my experience. I've had projects where I have a very involved owner and they can go either way. They can go very quickly and very productive or they will just spend years designing. And then I have projects where the owner was nowhere to be seen, but I had a great contractor, a great GC, and we started to finish that project, no issues, and we work well with the architect. Never, I never had any callback. So, so, so the teams make a huge difference. I mean, I think again to the, the start of the conversation, we said, "Why are we all talking to each other?" Because we saw alignment in how we want to do the work, and and we kind of pick out clients that are the same way. Are they part of that alignment that they want to do good work? And then, you know, we can we can work together. That has to be the most common theme of every facade consultant I know for the last five years is saying. We're looking to align ourselves with like-minded owners and generals and not just go out to every job because they realize how much risk there is in working on the wrong projects with the wrong people. And honestly, with the state of insurance these days, I don't know how everyone is not doing that, but you know, I, I could say I could tell you what Manny just said about working with owners that we know we can do a good project with, we can build a good building with, is what I hear from every one of the consultants that I respect, that I speak to these days. It is, it was without a doubt in front of everyone's mind right now, especially considering what's going on on the owner's end. I was speaking to somebody this morning who told me, you know what, I'm having some very uh, interesting conversations with owners who have major financing packages coming due over the next three, four years, who are gonna be, if they were homeowners, would be considered underwater on their loans, right? Because 8%, is a lot different than 2.5% interest. And now they have to refinance these, these loans on these buildings. And they're very, very hesitant to do a lot of things on existing buildings right now yeah. because, and, and a lot of the facade consultants that we're talking to about these energy and facade upgrades are saying, you know what, we're, we're handpicking who we're working with because if they're not cashed up, we don't wanna get involved because we'll spend a lot of time bidding a project, developing a project, maybe three years to develop something gratis, right? Because that's business development. And then it's going to drop off the end of the earth because they have no money. So it, that's the business side of the facade consulting business. But I think it impacts our everyday performance of how we do, well, more you guys than us, but how we do work. And, and I think that's, I think you're going to see more and more of that in the next year or two. All right. I'm going to cut you two chatty Cathy's off because we are way past our time. <laughs> this was fun. Thank you both. Let's, let's, uh, let's do it again soon. You got it, my friend. Talk to you guys soon. Talk Thanks, to you guys. Soon, guys. Thanks, guys.